My name is Barb Baustad, and I'm a meteorologist and climate program manager, or climate focal point, or whatever your words are, uh, at the National Weather Service office in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, John Eyes is on the line here and has organized our webinar, and we'll be recording it. So I uh, just want to repeat his reminder. If you could, make sure you're muted uh, through, the, through the presentation so that we get a good, clean recording, and then this will be made available later. Um, and uh, the, what I'm going to present here is work that was done during a rotational assignment that I did this summer with NOAA Central Region, Weather Service Central Region, NCDC Central Region, and NIDIS all sponsoring that, that rotation. And the goal of this, this piece of the rotational assignment was to create a template for presentations that we in the field in the Weather Service could go out and give to ag-based audiences, and especially to NRCS. Uh, natural Resources Conservation District audiences. So what I'm going to be doing in this presentation is giving a bit of background in what we were trying to achieve, and then I'm going to give a demonstration of the presentation as if I was giving it for an audience here in the Omaha County Warning Area uh, right now looking ahead to their interests for next spring. So um, after that, we'll have time for questions and answers as well. So let me get my presentation started here. I first want to emphasize that this was done in partnership not only with everybody I just named for the rotational assignment, but also with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, and that was especially uh, Verlin Barnes, along with USDA Ag Climate Hub, uh, Justin Derner, who is on the line here. Uh, state climatologists also contributed to this, Dennis Toddy and Jim Angel. And I feel terrible, Laura, I left your name off that list too, but Laura Edwards from uh, South Dakota is, uh, Extension is also uh, someone who contributed to this. And within the Weather Service, I worked a lot with Ray Wolf on this as well. So uh, the, the partnership to create this presentation was really important because uh, the USDA folks know what ag audiences want to hear about, and the state climatologists have been doing this a lot longer than we have. So they have good background about what kind of information would be helpful uh, if we were going to be presenting about climate outlooks to an ag audience. And the goal of this, as I mentioned, was to develop a template climate outlook presentation that any office could take down off of Central Region's server, uh, adapt it to your local area, adapt it to the season that you're in, and then give that presentation, uh, whether it's the climate focal point or someone else in your office, uh, give that presentation to an ag-centered audience. Uh, it's possible that you might be approached by the NRCS or other ag groups to participate, or you might be maybe wanting to get in touch with your state climatologist to see if you can help them or participate. And um, a point I want to make uh, really strongly here at the beginning is the state climatologists in many states are making presentations like this already. Um, we can help and support each other by sharing the load and sharing the information and also by giving a, a unified message. So if you're interested in giving this kind of presentation or if you're approached about it, I would really encourage you to talk to your state climatologist and see if they're already giving this kind of presentation. Perhaps they have information they can share with you or, or tips or other such things. So um, and that's a nod to folks like Jim Angel and Dennis Toddy who's on the call right now. So um, that's my background on why we're doing this, but I want to give a chance for the ag specialists to really give a good, strong background on it. So Justin, um, do you have anything you'd like to say about what you're looking for in a presentation? Yeah, Barb. Uh, you know, I really appreciate your efforts and the combined efforts of the whole group on this. What we often hear from the audiences we work with, Barb, is, is that specific information related regarding the climate, current climate conditions, projections, especially for the growing season, uh, applicable to, you know, that individual rancher, farmer, and so forth. So that often becomes quite difficult given some of the more coarse-level predictions out there from National Drought Mitigation Center, you know, the Drought Monitor, or Climate Prediction Center with those maps. So that sort of more targeted information that state climatologists, National Weather Service, NOAA can provide I think really help engage the producers and, and make them feel that the information is directly applicable to them. So kudos to you for putting that together. And I think this sort of template is fantastic, uh, such that uniform information is being given out to producers across this region. All right. Thanks, Justin. And Dennis, do you have anything you'd like to say here up front, too? 
Um, no, I'll, I'll comment later. Okay, sounds uh, great. <laughs> I, I, I would say just one thing. This is Doug. Uh, Good, Clark. Doug. You are next uh, anyway. Oh, okay. Um, just wanted to say that, um, again, we very much appreciate the um, egg side help on this because we wouldn't be able to do it without them. And that, uh, and that it, this particular, uh, as Barb was, was, was saying, this particular uh, presentation wouldn't probably be applicable to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where Justin is, nor would it be uh, for Indiana. We also understand that we know we, we know the tools we have to work with on a national scale, and we know how good they are, or not, or how, how good they are and aren't. And to some degree, so does the ag community. Um, what they're what what I think they're looking for and often do is get uh, various weather related folks, whether it's from a local TV station, whether it's a climatolo state climatologist, whether it's a weather service, to come and give them some idea <laughs> of of what uh, could be happening in the next month, three months, six months, you know, and beyond, because the decision their decision trees. Um, or sort of interesting, and it does take it does take some time to sort of understand um, the types of information that you want, and, and, and Barb will cover some of that. Um, Justin kept telling us, and so did Verlin, you know, right now in October or November, when this is being developed, or even before that, people are making seed choice uh, seed uh, choices. Uh, you know, what seed am I going to be buying? What kind of seed should I buy? Drought tolerant, all these other things. And there's really not a lot from a uh, uh, let's just say a climate prediction center point of view that we can tell them six months out in terms of that. However, as Barb will also say, there are a lot of there are some indicators that can sway sway you slightly one way or the other in terms of soil moisture, stream flow, snow snowpack, and all that other stuff. Anyway, I'll I'll leave it up to Barb to be um, more clear on that stuff, but. Um, um, what I would what I would highly encourage is to work with your state climatologist if you do want to do this and sort of bounce it off them, or bounce it off someone like a um, someone you trust as a sort of someone knows a little bit more about ag like Barb or Ray Wolf or you know anybody really um, or Justin for that matter because they'll have some input for you and maybe help you refine if they're willing um, your uh, your presentation. That's it. Thank you. Great, thanks, hey, Doug. Hey, Barb, just, this is Justin. Just one more quick thing. Uh, we gave a similar presentation, uh, myself and Nolan Deskin, yesterday to a group in Colorado, included a lot of bankers, and their eyes and ears were really perked up when this sort of information was presented out there in terms of them, I think, understanding the risks and realities of production agriculture and what sort of tools are out there to help reduce some of that risk in these decisions down the road. So I think that's another viable audience we haven't really participated with in the past as valuable uh, applications here. Maybe you haven't, Justin, but we do. I've talked to him a number of times. Well, that's good. This was uh, with CoBank, I guess, one of the biggest banks in the country, and they're, they've got several folks really interested in, in what uh, Barb and others are doing. That's great, and it brings up a point that you know, while these are tar targeted to ag audiences, you know, there may be other audiences that are interested in templates like this or presentations like this too. So, just one final point here before I actually go into the presentation itself. Uh, a reminder: you are uh, all on the call as of right now. You are now ag specialists in eastern Nebraska and western Iowa listening to this presentation as a demonstration. Um, but when you uh, come out of your roles there and are back to being weather service employees and, and partners again, uh, these presentations will be online and downloadable from uh, Weather Service Central Region. And as you put them together, as Doug was saying, um, please feel free to contact either myself or Ray Wolf for help if uh, you have questions or kind of want guidance about what kind of information you might want to put in uh, to the template, then, then we're here to help, uh, especially for the next few months. I would uh, encourage you especially to lean on Ray as I will be out of the office, but uh, otherwise I'm here if you need me. And with that, I'm going to jump into the presentation itself, which is a climate and drought outlook as a demonstration for this webinar with a focus on eastern Nebraska and western Iowa. 
So I want to start with a bit of a recap on where we're at so far this winter. And I'm being a little bit loose in my definition of winter so far, really looking back at the last 30 days. Over the last 30 days, our temperatures have actually ended up averaging to uh, fairly near normal. We were cool earlier in the period in, say, November. We've been warm lately, so the balance has been to keep us near average. Precipitation-wise, um, in the last 30 days, most of our, our area has been uh, below normal. Uh, there's been a swath from around southwest Nebraska to northeast Nebraska that got a little bit more, and that was actually <clears throat> pretty recent. But Otherwise, it's been pretty dry in the area. This isn't a time of year where we're that sensitive to dry. Um, it is getting into the time of year where we get our lowest amount of precipitation for the year. But nonetheless, it is something we want to keep our eye on as we head through the winter months. If we look a little bit deeper uh, into the soil temperatures, our soil temperatures lately have been sitting near to slightly above freezing thanks to uh, some prolonged above freezing temperatures in the last couple of weeks. Frost depths are around zero to one inches after having an early freeze up that uh, thawed away again. Um, what that, why we look at this is to uh, get a feel for whether precipitation can still get into the ground and add to the soil moisture before the ground freezes up. So at this point, we do still have uh, loose ground and we would be able to take up some moisture if any would happen to fall. And soil moisture, uh, these numbers come from the USDA, and I've got four segments there, different parts of Iowa and uh, Nebraska all together. Uh, the story there, just crossing your eyes and looking at all the numbers, is that uh, most areas in this part of the country are inadequate to even surplus of water supply in the soil moisture. Uh, this is despite having been dry fairly recently. So. Uh, we're actually in fairly decent shape heading into a winter freeze-up right now. Looking at the latest U.S. drought monitor, our area is clear of any kind of drought or even abnormally dry conditions. Just off to the north and just off to the south, some of those areas have had a shortage of precipitation just a little bit longer than we have and are running just a little bit abnormally dry. Uh, but so far we haven't seen um, impacts of that sneaking into eastern Nebraska and western Iowa just yet. And looking at our stream flow, um, we've actually had uh, above normal stream flow along the Platte River Valley um, and along, um, well, along the Missouri River really in eastern Nebraska to western Iowa. So outside of those areas, we're running closer to normal and you really have to go down into say southwest Nebraska to north central Kansas to get into areas that have stream flow running below normal. So uh, in addition to keeping an eye on this just for uh, water supply issues, we're also, we keep an eye on this to look for ice jam potentials, which means if we have freeze ups and melt offs that happen rapidly, we'd want to be ca uh, cautious in these river basins, keeping an eye out for potential ice jam flooding as we go through the winter. I'm going to switch gears now. Uh, now that we've talked a bit about what we've been seeing over the last, say, few weeks, two months, and talk a bit about the current state of our climate signals. So you may have heard through the course of uh, this fall and winter about an El Nino and will it or won't it develop, is it developing? We have been for months now, and we remain in an El Nino watch, which means we have and so neutral conditions for now, but there is still the potential that an El Nino will develop for this winter. What an El Nino means around here can really vary uh, depending on how strong it is and when it develops and what else is going on in the atmosphere. Uh, and that's really true everywhere, uh, but especially true here in the central part of the country because we're, we're pretty far inland and we have a lot of influences affecting us. So um, in our area, we can tend to uh, maybe tip the odds to being slightly warmer than normal through the winter months. Uh, we don't have great tendencies that show up in our area for precipitation, but it's just something we'll keep an eye on here as we go through the winter. One of the other climate signals that we keep an eye on here is uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, or NAO. This one got a lot of attention back in the winter of 2009 to 10 when it was strongly negative and was one of the factors contributing to us having such a brutal winter that year. In this case, so far, uh, we've been running mainly positive on the North Atlantic Oscillation, which contributes to some of the warmer temperatures we've been feeling lately. 
Uh, if we look ahead into the end of December or so, we are looking at a, a dive down into maybe neutral to negative NAO, so um, perhaps tipping us toward cooler than normal temperatures, and that's a signal that's supported elsewhere, too, that we'll look at. But if we look at past uh, El Nino and, I'm sorry, at the top that should say positive AO uh, impacts, AO and NAO are, are related signals, not exactly the same, but um, they can give us some of the same uh, conditions. If we look at El Nino past impacts in our area, there's a slight tilt toward wetter than normal conditions in eastern Nebraska if you look just at the month of March, uh, which means if we're carrying El Nino conditions all the way through the month of March, maybe uh, there's that possibility of getting the spring to tilt a little bit wet. That's the uh, graphic in the upper left. If you look at the graphic in the lower left, um, the temperatures, there may be a slight tilt toward cooler than normal conditions, again, looking at the month of March. So as we get into spring, maybe these could have some influence. The, the tendencies aren't that strong, but something just to keep an eye on. Uh, in our area, uh, if we stick in a positive AO through the winter months, it really doesn't have that much impact on our precipitation or temperatures, at least on, on these maps. So um, again, in the central part of the country, some of our signals can wash each other out. So, um, interestingly, if uh, we do have a strong negative or a strong positive AO, it actually usually wins the battle with El Nino and tips our temperatures one way or the other, but it doesn't look like we're heading that way right now at least. So these are signals we'll continue to monitor through the winter months just to see their impacts. We'll also monitor them as we go into spring because they can have an influence on yields specifically as we head into the spring months. So again, that should say positive at the top, I'm sorry. Um, I'll correct that before I post this, but uh, the corn yields, uh, when an El Nino is present during the growing season, uh, corn yields in eastern Nebraska and western Iowa don't tend to tip one way or the other, but if there's a positive AO, uh, those corn yields may maybe tend to tip just slightly toward below normal, so just something, again, to keep an eye on as we go through the winter and into the spring months. Um, again, these are impacts that have happened in the past. It's not a guarantee of future impacts, just something that we've noticed before that maybe we would want to keep our eye on heading into the spring months. Um, as we go into thinking about what goes in the climate outlooks, there are a number of things, and another one of them besides those climate signals I showed you uh, are the climate forecasts. They come from models just like the weather models that we have out there, and they're about as good as the weather models we have out there, meaning sometimes they do really well catching on to signals, and sometimes they're kind of out to lunch. Um, but this is one of the models we use pretty frequently here in the United States, and it, it does a decent job, especially if it's showing some kind of strong signal. Um, right now, the average guess, if you'll call it that, for total precipitation between December 25th and January 22nd would be uh, about an inch and a half to two inches in eastern Nebraska to western Iowa. That would be a wetter than normal signal. Um, so perhaps indicating a wetter than normal core of winter. The average guess for the total number of days in that same period with the high temperature above freezing is about 14 to 18 days, or about half of the days during that period. So what that's saying is that it's not a slam dunk that that's going to be all snow, all rain, or anything like that. To me, that's a pretty average signal that we could be, you know, some of that precipitation could be mixed, some of it could be rain, some of it could be snow. Uh, we don't have a good, strong feel for it one way or the other. But again, this is a model that we look at. We'll, We'd watch this just like we watch the other signals to see how they develop and evolve as we head into the core of winter and then out into the spring months. One more thing that contributes to our climate outlooks are the trends in the area. Um, there are definitely trends, uh, especially based on what season we're looking at. Temperatures do continue to rise in our area. They've trended warmer over the last several decades, and they continue to do so. And that's especially true in the winter months. So. Um, our outlooks kind of take that into account as we, as we go to look at those. And in addition, uh, especially when I go and look in Iowa, precipitation has been tending to increase in the spring months and into the summer. And that's especially true of uh, how frequent we get heavy rain events. So um, again, that's kind of on the background of stuff we look at. It's not a strong influence in any given outlook year to year, but it's something that we keep in mind as we start to look at what our outlooks might be is that there's a trend kind of underlying everything else that's going on too. So finally getting into that winter outlook, 
Um, all that build up to tell you that our outlook from the Climate Prediction Center is not all that specific for this winter. We have equal chances for temperatures to be in the warmest, the middle, or the coldest thirds compared to climatology. Or to put it another way, if I was a gambling person and wanted to load the dice, in this case the dice are just not loaded very well. Um, a good way to look at that too is the pie chart here in the lower right corner. That's actually specific to Omaha, Nebraska. And um, these are available for a number of sites. You can get to them at the link I've got on the bottom here. A number of locations around our area. So if you can find one that's close to you, it gives you an idea of the outlook, not only the outlook, but what it means, uh, what the temperature range would be on average. The basis for this outlook would include that El Nino, and that's why you see the, the warmer signal up, say, in the Pacific Northwest, and the cooler signal down in the southern states to the Ohio River Valley. They also base it on trends, uh, the models like the one I just showed you, and, um, and moisture, soil moisture if it's really especially uh, dry or especially wet. But what this says to me here is we just don't have a great signal to tip our odds one way or the other. We don't have a lot to hang our hat on. And of course, the same is true of precipitation. Once again, we're looking at equal chances for the precipitation to be in the wettest, the middle, or the driest thirds compared to climatology. We don't have the nice pie charts for each location for precipitation. That's only a temperature thing for now. But it's the same reasoning. Our, our forecast tools just don't give us a strong enough signal to tip the odds one way or the other. So as a gambling person, I've got nothing to, to load my dice with. But one thing we can see, at least in the drought outlook, is uh, good news. We, we don't have drought in the area now, and we do not have drought development indicated in our area in the next three months. So that's a good sign here, and that, that goes well with uh, some of the stuff I was showing just a few slides ago that indicate, if anything, maybe we tilt just a little bit toward the wet side in parts of the winter months. We can look a little bit closer in time, and, and right now this might not be helpful to you other than maybe planning your vacations uh, for Christmas time and, and the new year, but as you head into spring, these outlooks get really handy to help pick up on signals of whether we're looking at potential to be wet or dry or uh, cold or warm. So just looking at this latest 8 to 14 day outlook, um, we recently had the warm temperatures, but the outlook is indicating a flip to perhaps an increasing chance of below normal temperatures toward the end of the year. This outlook is good for December 24th to 30th, so getting toward the uh, last week of December. And near Omaha, um, there's a, about a 33 to 40 percent chance for below normal temperatures and for above normal precipitation, which means we've just very lightly loaded the dice. We'll give them a little bit of a, a tendency, but you know we could still roll the other ways pretty easily too, as you could see from the pie charts. Um, and remember, these are always interpreted as chances. Uh, the darker the color is, the, the greater the chance is to be in a certain category. It doesn't necessarily tell us the amount. Uh, it doesn't tell us how much rain will fall, and it doesn't tell us how cold will be, just that the chances increase. Um, and then just to give you guys a little weather forecast, and again, you can follow us online. Our, our web address is uh, down on the bottom of the page. But uh, light snow possible tonight into Thursday. Um, not looking at big moisture amounts. And then really no significant precipitation after that through the next seven days. Although if we look just a little bit further than that, perhaps we're seeing the hint of uh, potential precipitation sometime around Christmas Day. I don't want to get anybody's hopes up for a white Christmas, but we might see some precipitation just before or just after Christmas. And as for temperatures, we're looking at roughly near to above normal temperatures through the next seven days, basically fluctuating into the upper 30s to around 40. Um, what that means is our ground is not necessarily going to freeze up really quickly. Um, we're not likely to grow a lot of ice on the rivers. It's uh, kind of status quo here for about a week. So one source I want to make sure I, I point out to you guys also for information, especially as we get into the spring months, is this weekly weather and crop bulletin. And again, I've included a link here on the, on the presentation. This is a weekly update of uh, agriculture conditions, not just in the United States, but also globally. They are pretty vague if you're trying to look at a specific location, but if you're trying to get a feel for what's going on elsewhere in the country or elsewhere in the world, maybe get a sense of where prices might be going. Um, this kind of a bulletin might help you keep up with uh, areas that are uh, either doing well or maybe getting some impacts from dryness, for example. And this is a partnership between the Weather Services Climate Prediction Center and the USDA World Agricultural Outlook Board, a 
updated once a week. And um, again, I'm kind of throwing this link in here, um, not because it's going to help now. This isn't the great time of year to be looking for uh, spring flood outlook and spring potential. But if you take that link home with you and look at it a little bit later this winter, especially getting into about February or so, it might be able to give you a flood outlook that could be useful. Um, so keep an eye on that page and take a look as we get a little bit closer to the thawing season. And those outlooks can give you the chance of uh, flooding in the area, which again is pretty helpful as you head into the spring months. And um, this is where I step outside my role for just a minute, where I have a slide here for local studies. Uh, I wish we had something to put in this spot here, and uh, I think we'll be coming up with some things here probably in the next year or so. But if you have some information of interest, this is a great place to include it. If you've done research, for example, using the LCAT tool to look at the potential for um, El Nino to have impacts in your local area, throw it in here. Or if you've looked at uh, precipitation trends, for example, this is also a great place for it. Now, um, I've given you guys a lot of information, and um, the great thing about information is that it flows two ways. And, there's a lot of times where we want the information that you all have so that we can do a better job trying to assess what's going on. One way to do that is uh, to ask you for your help by joining COCORAS, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. It's a volunteer precipitation observing network. which just uses a $30 rain gauge that you put up uh, on a post somewhere and read it once a day and submit your reports online. And then that data is accessed by Everybody from us in the Weather Service to the state climatologists, the USDA, and a whole host of others to try and get an assessment of maybe areas that are emerging with wetness or dryness, for example. Uh, a great website, uh, lower right there, cocoraz.org. And other than the cost of the gauge, it's free to join. It's a great way to share information. And if we were in a drought, <laughs> um, this would be especially helpful. But uh, it's inevitable we'll get there again. And when we are, uh, we have this site called the Drought Impact Reporter, where we will take your direct observations straight from your field to let us know um, what's going on in your backyard. Uh, because if we know what's going on in your backyard, we can get a better sense of uh, conditions that might change or how uh, weather or climate signals might affect you coming up. So, you, uh, you go to this website here on the lower right and just click on that Submit a Report form and uh, let us know what's going on, let, especially if your drought status is changing, if, if you feel like you're really drying out, for example, in your fields, if you feel like um, things are really improving also. Um, this is all stuff that can help us and help the drought experts really get a handle on, on what's going on locally for you. I've included some sites here for uh, further reference. The top three, the big climate or the big uh, government ones, drought.gov, climate.gov, and weather.gov. You'll find lots of information there to um, everything from your local forecast to climate outlooks to uh, decision support tools and links that can help you get information that you need. The same is true of the High Plains and Midwestern Regional Climate Centers. Uh, the High Plains generally serves Nebraska folks. Midwestern generally serves the Iowa folks and uh, also the USDA and a couple other tools that are there. Um, these are just here for your future reference. And with that, um, now is the point where I will take any questions. And that would be from the ag audience. But in this case, uh, I would take any questions on this presentation from you folks as weather service people now or as partners now. And a reminder that I'm here for assistance if you need it. And uh, especially when I'm out for a little while, Ray Wolf is also available and has a tremendous amount of expertise in this area and can help as well. Hey, Barb, can we check and see if Verlin Barnes is on yet? I am on. Great, Verlin. Um, I apologize you... for being so late. <laughs> That's OK. Would you be willing to share a few comments on uh, the kind of information uh, and the kind of audiences that you'd, you think might be interested in these kinds of presentations? Um, yes, I would. Um, the types of audiences, uh, NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, host and or participates in the planning of events uh, quite often 
in the local communities. We have office, field offices in nearly every county of the nation. And so we have people planning and hosting these events quite often. And at these events are ag producers primarily, but some of the other ag folks in the community, such as uh, feed and seed dealers and bankers and that kind of stuff, um, are also in the audience at times. So those are the audiences, The some of the things we're looking at, what what Barb showed here was some great information. They, the farmers are always interested in weather and getting an updated weather um, review from somebody and any kind of long-term or out forecasting out there three months or so. Um, or I know it's harder longer than that, but if you can get those kind of forecasts, it helps them plan on on their farm, what they're going to do, what they're going to plant, uh, how they're going to take care of activities. Um, these are both crop and livestock folks, and so um, these, this type of thing is is uh, of interest to those folks. So I appreciate um, you guys taking the time to put this template together, and thank you, Barb, on doing that. Well, thank you, Verlin, for being a, a part of the process. And uh, for the folks who are listening and thinking about this as a potential template for themselves, you'll notice I gave it fairly briefly. That was, what, about a 20-minute or so presentation. Um, designed it to be fairly brief because, you know, we don't often get an hour on the agenda at these kinds of meetings, maybe, maybe 15 minutes, maybe half an hour if we're lucky. So um, part of this uh, talk was designed with being brief in mind, too. And, and to, to sort of elicit questions, so that's the other thing is to sort of perk, their, perk any interest that may be there. There may not be, and that's okay, too. Um, I'm guessing Justin and Verlin and Dennis have, have all sat through meetings or given, given talks where, um, you know, you just tell them what you know, and, and that's it. But the other times where they hear El Nino's coming, my, my gosh, you're going to be inundated with different beliefs and myths and a uh, few truths. <laughs> so, uh, it's 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 going to be different every time you do it, and um, uh, I, I guess what I would say is be as flexible as you can. That'd be the other thing. Find out what they want is is really a key, as opposing to as opposed to knowing what you think they want. That's a, that's a good thing to do. Now they may ask for six months out, and I don't think Barb Barb you got too much into the growing season, did you? I didn't. Um... And uh, the reason I didn't is that this time around it's pretty much the same as the winter outlook. It's equal chances all the way through. Right. Um, um, capturing so, when there are signals showing up I think is really critical too. So there will be, que there will inevitably, will be questions about that. I, I, I'm guessing, Justin and, and Verlin, you can confirm that. This is the time of year where they want to know what's going to happen in the spring, let alone June and July and August, right? Yes, the spring would be foremost on their minds, I think, for yeah. planting. And I and I think the other thing was that it was the winter season more or less that, at least from the NRCS point of view, that a lot of these ag meetings would be held. Is that correct? Generally speaking, yes, that's when they would be held, yes. Okay. Um, but I, I believe there's some folks out there in our community that um, – aren't aware of some of your new products and, and these maps and so forth that um, would really give them a, a help open their eyes and get them connected, I think. So I think it would be great. And, you know, and there's a lot more that Barb didn't show um, that could be incorporated out of um, NCDC or RCCs or wherever. Um, there's trend lines and everything else. Oh, the there's a lot of them there. I was going to say, your state climate office probably knows a lot of those. As well. And that's one of those times when uh, getting to discuss this with your state climatologist ahead of time, they might be able to point you to, you know, tools or websites or things they would include, if, you know, more specific to their state or their local area. Hey, Barb, and maybe more, more so for Dennis, do you get any sort of request for uh, apps or something for folks to download that they can do some of the check
checking of the conditions on their own, or is it largely website uh, that you get questions about? Um, they, if there are apps available to do these things, yes. That's why I try to include as much about websites as possible um, to, so they can go find them themselves. I, I don't oftentimes recommend apps because it's hard to evaluate and keep track of all of them. Um, you know, just, just for the weather service folks, everybody has a weather app. And remind them that just because they have a weather app, that doesn't necessarily mean they're getting the right information because everybody's got a weather app uh, that tells them, obviously, what it is, where they are, and they don't, those don't always work very well. So um, if you have ones that you can point to, that's great. Go ahead and do that. Um, if I could make a couple other comments here, uh, Barb, you made the comment, you know, talking about winter winter outlooks, and you're kind of going, well, you know, if you're traveling somewhere for Christmas, uh, Verlin brought up a lot of these folks have livestock. So what happens in the winter time helps impacts them, especially dealing with livestock, because livestock use more energy when weather conditions are bad. Not only when, when there's a big storm, but when conditions are very cold, they need more energy and they have to uh, change some feeding they do. So knowing that's coming up is, is, is beneficial. It's also good for the, the livestock, the producer, too, to know these conditions are coming up so that they can kind of start dealing with those. Um, oh, thanks. That's a really good point, Dennis. Yep. I, I, I have to keep reminding myself that that happens, that, there's a lot of people who just do crops, but there's a lot of people who steal the livestock, and that's an important thing for them, them to know about. Um, and, and bad winters, even though it doesn't mean much for crop perspective, uh, ranchers really wear down after long, long winters because of dealing with moving snow and things like that for their cattle. Um, Barb, I need to get you a different uh, link for U2U that is, that is a better link than that one is. Okay, we'll do that before we send the template up to uh, John Eyes to post online then. Yep. Uh, another thing I like to try to include is, is if, especially if it's a local meeting, have, a, have an image of temperature and precipitation at that location for the last year or so. It's sometimes a good, just kind of a good review of what happened during the year so people can uh, look back on it and think. You, you showed the map, and that's good, but especially if it's people from the county, it's good to show that and have that available for people, too. Oh, the other thing about Doug, Doug mentioning about ask people what they want. Maybe even better is ask them what decisions they're trying to make. Because they may not know what they want or what they need, but sometimes they're trying to make decisions and they can give you information on what decisions they're trying to make. Um, and a couple of the questions that, that almost regularly will come up is people will ask you what's going on in South America because that influences crop marketing decisions. If you know something about what's going on there, fine, say it. If not, defer to somebody else. Um, and the other one is you'll, you're, you get ready to be, what do you think about global warming? That's the most common question I get wherever I go. So mm -hmm. just have your, your answer ready for how you want to deal with that. That's a that's a good point, Dennis. You know, we uh, when we were putting this presentation together, we had some discussions about whether to include a slide or two of a direct uh, to directly address climate change and you know the supporting evidence behind it occurring and, and potential causes. We opted to leave it out, but that doesn't mean you have to leave it out. You certainly can put something in there if you'd like to. I would, uh, in that case, I would refer you to the National Climate Assessment. And uh, the most, re well, especially that, the IPCC is helpful too, but really the National Climate Assessment has nice graphics that are a little more regional. Um, and draw your information from there so that you're starting from a good point where it will be consistent with current research. Excellent stuff, Dennis. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, hearing none, if you think of them later, please feel free to email me. And again, this will be recorded and posted online so that it can be accessed in the future for those who want to put their own templates together and to get a feel for what was presented at least to a mock audience. Thank you all for being here and participating. Thanks especially to 
those of you who partnered to produce this talk and are here so that you could uh, give some background and uh, give some information and ask some good questions too. And unless I hear anything else, I believe we are